Well, thank you so much for joining us. Once again, I apologize for all those technical difficulties. Gotta love technology. Thank you for having me. I apologize for chewing oatmeal when you uh, started the recording. I mean, we can all just say it's a snack time. Everyone else have their food. I've got some cookies behind me we can always pull out. It's fine. Snack time with Christian and Allie. It sounds yeah. adorable. We've it's started great. it. This is fantastic. All right. What are we talking about today, Allie? So today we are talking about your book, Scary Stories for Young Foxes. Um, I, I Yeah. I mean, it sounds like a pretty good one. Um, so do you want to start off with telling us just a brief description of what your book is about? Absolutely. So, um, when I was, uh, a little wee kit, I was obsessed with these, uh, Berenstain Bears books, uh, the, the spooky editions, specifically oh, yes. the spooky old tree and bears in the night. And I loved these so much that when I became a children's author, I wanted to rewrite them, but I wanted to age them up to middle grade and I wanted to make them actually terrifying. Cause there was something that I really enjoy about like that cozy feeling of, uh, you know, like having a tree house with like a mama bear waiting for you when you set out and you go through like all of these, you know, harrowing adventures. Um, but then, you know, in the end, you're 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 tucked back uh, in bed, or you make it back to your to your mom, and it's just it's just sort of a lovely feeling, you know. It kind of it 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 creates like this this perfect circle for me where, um, you know, like we we venture into scary stories. Uh, to learn something, to change, to grow, to do something. But then, you know, we do always want to come home safe. Um, so when I first wrote this story, I actually wrote it like with the little foxes walking on two paws and wearing little outfits and trundling down to uh, Mitch, Mrs. Badger's shop to buy a goose for dinner. And um, my agent said you, my friends, have pulled off the hat trick of publishing no-nos. Number one, no short story collections. No kid likes them. Number two, no scary stories. They weren't doing well at the time. And number three, most importantly, no anthropomorphism. Nobody can handle talking animals. So I was like, okay, fine. But the, the idea meant enough to me that I was like, well, then how could I make this work based on his advice. So I went through, and first of all, I knocked down all the walls between the short stories. So it became a novel mm -hmm. in disguise. And then um, I added like just as much humor and, and heart and meaning into the story. So that like that, that those scary aspects were, were worth it, you know, like the cozy treehouse aspect. And finally, and most importantly, and this is honestly when the when the story just took off, I uh, compared um, real life fox experiences because you know I'm trying to get away from anthropomorphism to please my agent. So I so I really studied real life fox experiences and then found all of these fascinating parallels to classic horror stories. So you know, what is a rabies outbreak to a fox, but a zombie story? What is a little old woman who lives in the woods and captures small critters so she can peel off their skins and stuff them and draw them for her picture books? A witch story, you know? And white camouflage in the snow, ghost story, mm -hmm. you know, sharp fanged alpha male that is trying to draw young vixens into his pile of rocks, vampire story. So it was mostly a, a matter of just like collecting a lot of those different tropes and then bringing them to life in a believable and meaningful way with baby foxes that everybody does not want to watch die. Oh, yeah, they were definitely very cute. I liked reading that part of the story. Um, so then with that, how long, how you said it, your agent initially said, here are your three no-nos. You had to write it again. How long did it take you to form this story? So I'd say from the moment that I uh, wrote 
that initial short story, which was just like 20, 21 pages. Um, it, and to the moment that like I, I finished the sequel, probably around 10 years. Oh, okay. Yeah, That's- it probably took me a, a full decade of like, I just hit myself in the face by doing that. <laughs> Um, it, t- it took me like a, a full decade of uh, exploring and plunging and rearranging and becoming a good enough writer. I I hoped to like capture it. Um, but one of the really interesting stories is that I used to run this uh, storytelling group with a friend of mine and uh, we decided to do a Halloween show. And I told everyone, I was like, bring the pain. Let's make this scary. Let's make this horrifying. And I wrote a story that was so disturbing that one of the other storytellers was like, I don't want to be in the show anymore. That's how much it scares me. The other ones were okay with it. And I was like, well, I want everyone to feel safe and good. So three days before the show, and we've been rehearsing and working on it for months, three days before the show, I was like, oh man, I need to bring some lightness to this show that I was like, must be terrifying. So I was like, well, what makes me feel like cozy and nice in my heart? And the answer was Berenstain Bears. And I was like, I'm just going to recreate that real quick and didn't sleep for like 72 hours. So that's how it was created. So I I have to thank that storyteller for (laughs) being so disturbed. by. Sounds like a true labor of love, though. I mean, 10 years is a lot of dedication. You said it. That's that's the best description of it for sure. Were there ever moments where you thought it wasn't going to make its way to publication with it taking that long? Well, you know, I was really confident in it. And I think like my first two books just really didn't do uh, great. And it's no wonder because I wasn't, I was just sort of like pulling from the surface, like, oh, what's a fun idea? As opposed to like, what are the ideas that like come from here, you know? And so being in publishing was so punishing and so hard and so little money that I was like, okay, well then I want to write something really crazy that no one's ever heard of, like scary stories for young foxes. I love it. I think it will do great. But if this doesn't work, you know, that was, that was my feeling. Like if, if this isn't it, then why am I doing this? You know? So, but, but I think it is like that, that level of risk. And I think that like the thing that really pushed me forward, because if it was just about telling a a story about bad things that happened to foxes, I don't think that I would have like pushed it that much. Um, it, It is more about like, why do we tell zombie stories? Why do we tell vampire stories? Why do we tell ghost stories? And, you know, for me, a a ghost story is just anything uh, in our past that's still haunting us. Um, A vampire story is something alluring in the darkness that draws you in, right? Like we always make vampires really like hot and, and attractive and things. And I think that's because like you have to invite them in right? Like that's your choice to become part of that. And so I think that could be anything from drugs to stranger danger to, you know, many things that Mr. Scratch sort of uh, represents. And then something like a zombie, which I, I find infinitely fascinating, is what do you do if someone that you love and trust and recognize suddenly becomes a threat? you know? And is that a disease? Is that alcoholism? I think that's more of a werewolf story because there's a shame involved in that. But you know, these, these are like, these are things that, that kids grapple with or will grapple with, or have peers who are absolutely grappling with. Right. Parents with alcohol problems, strangers, complications, all these things. And I wanted to give them something real to bite into, to consider these, these themes for themselves. A way they can see it, but it still has that animal aspect to it. Exactly. 
As a friend pointed out to me, if I were to retell Miss Vix with humans, it would be about a kid showing up to uh, school only to find his sister, his uh, teacher has rabies and has killed everyone in the classroom. <laughs> and like, that's uh, not a kid's story, but no. you make it boxes. And it's- somehow they can understand it and it's not too much to take in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had this, I had this experience. Um, my my girlfriend at the time's daughters who were four and six i one of them was very easily scared the other one not so much but she was the four-year-old um we were watching planet earth and i don't know if you've seen that scene where uh these baby iguanas are are hatching in the rocks and they're absolutely adorable and they need to get down to the ocean where it's safe but between them and the and the waves all along the beach are like hundreds, if not thousands, of writhing snakes waiting to eat them. Ooh. And uh, you know the 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 whole segment is this journey, like this harrowing journey that's just what several yards, mm-hmm. but filled with death. And I expected when I watched this with my ex's daughters, I expected that they would run screaming from the room. And instead they were fascinated. There was something about them that understood that this is a part of nature, right? It exists because they eat each other. Yes, we all depend on each other in some way or another. Right, hopefully not eating each other, but yeah, yeah. That that is nature. (laughs) It is nature. Um, so I know you mentioned this story kind of stemmed from how your, your love of the Berenstain bear stories and their spooky stories. What made you pick foxes over bears? Like, how did you make that transition? They seem just- cool looking. I j- yeah. genuinely was that I, I closed my eyes and aesthetically that's what popped into my head, you know, um, I, uh, foxes are not my favorite animal. I mean, I get asked what my favorite animal is all the time and I don't have one. I try not to rank animals. They're all important, yes. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> even, even like the, the hideous ones are some way keeping the cute ones alive. You know, it's all just a big balance. So no, I mean, it just kind of was, seems it nice. Yeah. yeah. It came to me. I like to say. There you go. It was that great inspiration. Yeah, 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 exactly. So then with the foxes, I know like in some of them, they have so many siblings. Um, Do you have any siblings or like, did you draw on certain sibling relationships when you were writing these characters? None. No, (laughs) I have zero siblings. How did I do? Do you have siblings? I do. Yes. I have a brother and some of the nitpicking we definitely, while we are close now at the time, we definitely had our fair share of little spats every now and then sure yeah yeah um yeah I uh I mean obviously like Mia has a very healthy relationship with her siblings in the beginning Mm -hmm. of the book and um Uli has a very unhealthy relationship with his sisters and it's interesting because I've never thought about this before but you know, is, is that because of where they're growing up? You know, like Mia's in the Evie Wood, which has, you know, plenty of raspberries and grasshoppers and all these things. And Uli is in a rockier place where it's, it's tougher to, to catch these things. And so is it like the, the, the harsh environment that he's in that causes his six sisters to be like, Oh, and he also has more of them. I've never even thought about right. this. That causes them to be like, uh, okay, well, you know, it, with with not much food around, we got to starve the runt, which unfortunately can it happens. Be what happens. Yeah, which was Uli's main inspiration. And, you know, that if there, if there is uh, a birth, uh, do we say deformity? I, that sounds so hideous. I don't like that. Right. I just keep, I, I, that's like the last word I heard used. Um, like if uh, born, born with a disability. There you go. Probably. Very easy. Well, glad we scrubbed that one. <laughs> um, uh, 
I, uh, you know, that, that, um, that he probably just wouldn't have, have survived the first week, you know, right. and there's even an instinct. And, and then if uh, males hang around too long, uh, then their, their dads will feel threatened by them and uh, actually attack them. So, you know, Mr. Scratch is like the quintessential abusive father. Mm -hmm. um, but, but also that is, that exists for foxes. Right. But also humans too. So why, why not, why not really look at it? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, it was uh, like, even when you mentioned like Yulia and his siblings, when they went on their first hunting trip, like mom even had to help him sniff stuff out. And she's like, oh, well, we'll tell your sisters you sniffed it. And you could tell right away the sisters were like, no, you didn't do that. So that that's where I'm like, you definitely nailed the sibling relationship, all of that trying to one up or the jealousy that they did better than you and oh good I'm 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 glad I just uh I had to have imaginary siblings and they were <laughs> awful to me yeah I mean my brother and I usually got along pretty well but those jealous moments definitely came out from time to time and with him being the older one I was always on that well I did it better and yeah so I definitely understood where Yuli was like getting that help from mom it was it helped him, but I can see where from the older siblings, it's like, but you had mom to help you. Yeah. 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 Which is, um, yeah. Ain't that just so sad when we get <laughs> upset when people get help. Right. And uh. we don't need it, but we're like, those people don't deserve that help at all. And then Why? it's unfortunate. Yeah. 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 Um, so then when it came to writing this book, you definitely did everything through the animal's perspective. Um, how hard was it describing day-to-day -day human objects? Like for instance, when Mia gets caught in the trap, you never once refer to it as such. It's whether it's the sil silver root or whatever else, but how hard was it trying to describe it in a way that kids would still understand what that object was? Oh, Allie, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate this question because it was excruciatingly <laughs> difficult. It was so hard. Um, yeah, I mean, like the, I, there, there were some, you know, bits and pieces that were just sort of left out in the, in the wild or that they stumbled across in the wild uh, were relatively easy because it's like, well, what would a silver you know rattly thing maybe a serpent maybe a root um or like a road like a wide black still river you know yeah. like those those are pretty easy to sort once we got into Beatrix Potter's cabin <whistles> oh that was so much work that was so 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 much work and then, you know, at one point I did decide that I wasn't going to use any of the terminology that a human would use. Like early on, I was like, no clever as a fox, none of that. Like that just is, doesn't feel like part of fox culture. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it, it uh, yeah, I, I also decided that they wouldn't be able to name the monsters. They wouldn't say witch. They wouldn't say vampire. They wouldn't do any of those things. So coming up with, with words to describe those, ghost made sense for me for some reason. I feel like anything can have a ghost. Yeah. Um, but yeah, finding those, you know, like the yellow and all of that. It was, it was a trial, Beatrix Potter's being the absolute most difficult. And then of course, I loved the challenge so much that I decided to write an entire sequel that took place in the city that had all references to human things all throughout it. I was like, man, I didn't get enough of that. We should make it harder. Ugh, tough. But I mean, fortunately at this point, you know, foxes are living in the city. And so they have, they're knowledgeable of these things, sure. but it was still tough. Still real tough. Thank you for that question. I was just, cause yeah, as reading it, it's like, yeah, it's a silver root. And it's like, Okay. And then as you keep reading with context, it's like, oh yeah, that's definitely a trap. We're used to hearing that every day. But yeah. once again, yeah, a fox, generally speaking, until like Beatrix Potter used her magic of sorts, like they didn't know what humans were saying. They didn't know that's, you know, what we called it or whichever else, but yeah. Um, 
and it's, it's, it's interesting that you should you should say her magic of sorts i really really um i i don't know are you if 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 you're not the first person to pick up on that then you're the first person in a very very long time because that was like the one magical realism thing i did i was like she'll just snip a little bit of mia's fur away this will be her witch thing mm -hmm. and then she'll be able to talk to her and you know i do feel like beatrix potter had some idea of how to talk to animals she just didn't know how to hear them that's fair yeah you know? Because she just made them little humans, basically. Right. Because I like how you explained it, you know, when Mia was first taken. And then what was it she talked to a rabbit first, I believe. Um, yeah. And the rabbit was like, yeah, she, you know, snipped your hair and now you guys can communicate. So I love you explained it without oh, actually I explaining, <laughs> like, but here's how the magic behind it works. So you're right. like, that's what causes you to now understand it. But I like how you still managed to explain it without being like, well, here's the science behind it because of A, B, and C, because yeah. we didn't need that. Yeah. We don't need that. Yeah, yeah. And it's also kind of interesting that, like, she would collect a skin in order to, like, bring its soul to life on the page, but then just, like, a snip of hair in order to bring the words out. That's interesting. Interesting. <laughs> it worked out great. Great. <laughs> um, but then what made you pick like with Beatrix Potter as an actual author like that kids definitely recognize what made you pick that versus just making up an entirely new character genuinely <laughs> genuinely just I uh, just he heaven sent it feels because I was already working on the book I was literally I had my formula of like rabies equals zombie alpha male equals vampire sure. And a friend of mine sent me a newspaper clipping, mailed it to me. She cut it out of a newspaper, <laughs> some old magazine that she found, and was like, I thought you'd be interested in this. And it talked about how Beatrix Potter actually taxidermied her subjects because she was a scientist and she was genius. And, uh, you know, she was, she was really good. Like, of course, she was not allowed to be a scientist at that time because, you know, she had the wrong reproductive right organ, even though she was killing it in the scientific illustration department um and so you know she just had to turn to kids books because the science world wouldn't wouldn't have her so yeah she was she was very good at what she did and she was uh really about like you know tangible things that she could um like i a lot of her lines in the story I pulled from her actual diary. She really did call baby pigs little cherubs. She really did say, I believe that one must smell frost and taste grass in order to draw them or however that quote goes. Like those are all real Potter lines. And so it was just the moment I read that newspaper clipping, I was like, oh my gosh. And I'm a huge Beatrix Potter fan. People ask me that all the time. I adore her. I mean, I do think that that would be terrifying if I were a little fox and she were her. Um, but I, uh, but like, I, uh, yeah, I really, I really love her, but I just a little bit more, just like a tiny little bit more. I love ruining people's uh, perceptions of her and their childhoods. But you gave us all a new perspective. And I mean, as I was reading that part of the book, um, Rebecca, who also helps with summer scares, was the one who pointed that out, how you said, like, she actually did the taxidermy. She actually did this with the animals. And I was like, no, she didn't. She's she's a children's author. And she pulled up the article. And sure enough, there it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, um, but I'm not crazy about that but also but it's a very interesting side that most people don't even know about yeah yeah, yeah absolutely yeah my I... favorite one star review of goodreads on foxes this was like before <laughs> newberry honor when i used to you know foolishly read reviews but my favorite one star <laughs> review <coughs> is i hope the beatrix potter society revokes heidecker's membership for life Wow. We've done a good job, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I want yeah. to put that on a shirt. People um, always say, you know, it's not great if you don't offend at least somebody and you did it. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> hey. 
it works. I mean, and it's, it's such, it's a great story. Like you said, it's, you know, got the award behind it and you have your second book that does it come out later this summer? I think the sequel, or is it already out? Yeah. Came out, I think like two summers ago. No, no, no. Last summer. It did come out last, last summer. summer. Yes. The paperback is coming out in July. And listen, okay. have you, have you read this one yet, Alan? I have not. Sorry. Okay. Well, I, no pressure, no expectations and read whatever you want. Everyone should always read what they want. Always. Um, but I do think that this one is better and I promise that it's scarier and every person who's read it so far has told me they prefer it. It's very, very different, but I'll tell you, it's good. I like it. I may have to pick it up. I'll be the first to admit, I don't always do great with horror. Like I can read it, but you make me watch a horror movie and I can barely make it 30 minutes in. I, I hear you and I don't, I don't want to rattle your nerves anymore. And this one's tough. It is really tough. So you, you follow your heart. All right. Well, if we get the time, maybe we'll have to pick it up and try it and see if I can actually make it through a scarier story. I like it. Cool. Um, is there anything else you'd like to tell us about the book? Like fun parts when you were writing it or anything that you didn't expect? Oh, ooh, yeah. Okay. I'll tell you something I didn't <laughs> expect. Um, so, so th- there would be a, a few like truly chilling moments um, where by following the science of the foxes, uh, I was going to make the story markedly more disturbing than anything that I could come up with personally. And um, the more I learned about this stuff, the more these opportunities came up to just make it a lot darker. And the ending of the book, without giving anything away, the ending of the book came, it kind of gives something away, but that's fine. It came when I read the fact that Creatures who have rabies will survive anywhere from two weeks to 10 years. Wow. Yeah. I could see the two weeks, but didn't didn't see the 10 years coming. Right? Isn't that unsettling? Like really, really scary. I mean, it's rare, but there will be these creatures that are extra aggressive and carrying this virus and twitching and surviving freaky That's crazy yeah that changed the end of the book the snow ghost was like a snow fox because they are natural enemies of the red fox actually yeah and that shifted it that's speaking of ghosts grappling with your past right that's when i realized oh, oh okay i know who that is yeah. Um, so what was one of your favorite parts about writing the book? Like which how you said like you did the vampire analogy, the ghost, which part was kind of your favorite to bring to life? Uh the moment that Uli and Mia meet. That was my favorite moment. I um I didn't know what they would be like together, you know, and I wasn't planning of a lot of writing, especially when you're on deadline can be just by the seat of your pants, right. you know, or by the fur of your tail. <laughs> Even if you have like this whole huge plan, like really nailing it down, it can be really uh, strenuous. But one little fox kit who uh, had scary stories hidden from her to keep her safe from the darkness of the world is going to be way more optimistic about what the woods have inside them. And a little fox kit who was tortured by scary stories, you know, and made to, uh, and be controlled by them, um, is going to be too afraid, overly afraid of the woods. And so when those two started to intertwine and change each other and challenge each other's perceptions on what it means to live inside a scary story so that they could find a proper balance. Because I don't think either of them had the right outlook of what scary stories are for or what they do, right? Like 
zero scary stories, mm-hmm. you're not ready for the world. Yeah. Tortured by scary stories, like it sounds like you might be when you watch movies, <laughs> you're, the world's going to become way too scary. Right. right. And so I loved balancing those two until, you know, like it culminates with the paw where they create a scary story of their own and use it to stoke guilt in uh, in Mr. Scratch. But yeah, the scene where they meet is my favorite. And I have asked the production company with whom we are trying to get the uh, film made right now, um, if I could just write that scene, just that scene. And <laughs> just they've that said, one in particular. Just that one, you can have the rest. I've never written a screenplay before. You can change it, but let me try. Or at least like, you have the dominant they can help make it screen ready but you just have the plot yeah i'll just make it character yes no that's not true we have an amazing writer and you know that we have lena heady working with us as a producer i did not know do you know her i do not she played queen circe in game of thrones oh yes i do know her that way for our pitch, she reads the storyteller's voice and it is incredible. And That's she's the nicest person. And then as our showrunner, we have a man named Mark Bearhyden, who like, just to give you like a taste of, uh, of what direction we want to pull this, he wrote like Swamp Thing and Daredevil and okay. Heroes and The Mask and like Jim carries the mask. He has so many like amazing horror credits. And so, yeah, we're, we're hoping it happens, but we'll see. Keep your Very fingers crossed cool. for me. Yeah, because those were big names. Like you said, between Game of Thrones, the mask, like everybody knows all those. Yeah. I know. I know they do. Which is weird because I can't do a lot of horror, but I watched Game of Thrones. <laughs> well, well, you're going to be fine with this. Are you kidding? <laughs> yes, I can do it. No, yeah, no. that's. That's incredible. I will admit there were parts where I had to just, I let it play and I looked away for a little bit. So I listened to it. I just couldn't watch it. Me too with Game of Thrones. I mean, that's a brutal time. Yes. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So then I think one of my last big questions, you do have illustrations throughout the story. I mean, there's not a ton of them, but there are some from time to time. How do you think those helped enhance the book when you were writing it? Uh, you know, so so the the illustrations would come after the major movements of the story were set in stone because we had to make decisions about it. And then Junyi Wu, brilliant artist, needed to figure out how to bring them to life. Um, but I'll tell you, when I first saw them, it did inform the tone to a certain degree that I was writing. And what I wanted, what I asked for was like, you know, a a union of um, uh, scary stories uh, to tell in the dark and like something like Despero. Mm -hmm. And she nailed it. She was just amazing. And, and on top of that, you know, we, we went with somebody who was not, she, this was actually her first, yeah, this was her first uh, children's book, okay. um, and uh, and it was so it was so cool to have somebody with a distinct style who could do that proper balance of creepy and adorable. And yeah, I mean, I bought a bunch of her original artwork after getting the honor, just because I was like, this is incredible. Right. And the funniest thing about it is that the second. Uh, children's book that Jun Yi Wu illustrated was the biography of Beatrix Potter. <laughs> so she explored the insanely dark side first and then captured her whole. And right. then went to the, the picture books and all the cutesy side of it. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's right. Because I did like, you know, for the pictures in here, definitely keeping the black and white part of it. I think that helped with the eerie or like the spooky for the scary part of it. But it definitely, like you said, they were still children's style pictures where it wasn't anything too scary. It was just enough to add to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I I honestly wonder if we will ever get something like this again, you know? Yeah. Because I remember reading those growing up. Yep. Too much. Way, way, way too much. I'm going to show that too much right now. (laughs) Let's do it, right? 
Sure. And yeah, then we can I mean, it's, it's not, I mean, like, not actually too much, but just look at that. Look at that. But yeah. That's, She's I don't terrifying. Know, right. I don't know like, if that would make it into a book today. Yeah. Why not? I mean, unless That's it was why. closer to more like a YA or maybe an upper teen appeal, but for like a yeah, juvenile why? picture book. Why? Let's bring it back. It's so great. I'm okay. Did you read these when you were little? I did. Yeah. You okay. Yeah. I, I survived. I don't think they were too traumatic. Nah. Nah. On the edge, but not too traumatic. <laughs> <laughs> Enough to make you remember it, but nothing that left you scarred and can't sleep at night. Well said. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, I think those are the questions that I came prepared with, unless there's anything else that you'd like to add about your story. Um, no, uh, read it, check out the sequel. I get a lot, a lot of kids asking me if I'm going to work on a third one. Um, yeah. And, uh, especially because like, you know, some of like the things that all the readers were like, Oh, is this, does this happen in the sequel? Is all this stuff happen mm-hmm. in the sequel? No, it doesn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, me and Uli are a strong presence in there. Um, is all I'll say. Uh, but yeah, like, kids kids throw so many ideas at me when I go to schools and they ask me so many questions about like things I'd never heard of you know or things I'd never thought of and like uh I I they've kind of started to like plant some seeds where I'm like I like it "Ah, okay all right and I'll tell you because this this sequel is all if if the original one is classic horror stories, ghosts, witches, vampires, whatever, the sequel is all modern horror stories. So okay. it's robots and mummies and alien abductions and mad scientists. How do those all factor in? You'll have to find out. Just kidding. A mad scientist is a veterinarian. That one's pretty easy. Um, but I uh, but the yeah, like I. I never included a werewolf story and I think I could write one actually and it might be a graphic novel we'll see I have no idea yeah there you go that could work yeah and then if you know illustrator came back she could help with the whole thing oh my gosh oh I wonder if she would cool great question all right all right cool glad I could help with that part (laughs) that'll be my small contribution why didn't I even think of that hmm I'm gonna write her right now actually yeah i was gonna say who knows if she'd be interested or not but yeah yeah yeah. huh okay well um thanks for such spectacular questions i I mean it i uh you know i i get good questions but um these were really good these were very thoughtful and i i greatly appreciate that i'm glad yeah but thank you so much for joining us um it's been great having your book be a part of the summer scares and having all of us get a chance to read it um So yeah, thank you so much. And we look forward to working with you in the future. Me as well.